à tous. Euh, à l'occasion de l'événement Reproducibility euh, qui a eu lieu au euh, printemps 2021, nous avons eu l'honneur de recevoir Simine Vazir, qui est professeur à l'Université de Melbourne euh, en Australie et qui est probablement une des contributrices les plus influentes euh, à la métascience en ce qui concerne la psychologie, donc qui a probablement le plus contribué à améliorer la discipline psychologique. Euh, je ne vais pas énumérer le, toutes les récompenses qu'elle a pu obtenir car la liste est longue, mais euh, elle est par exemple euh, éditrice senior pour la revue Collabra Psychology, qui est une revue scientifique très très engagée euh, pour la transparence et les bonnes pratiques de recherche, et c'est également la cofondatrice de la CIPS, la Société pour l'amélioration euh, des sciences psychologiques. Donc vraiment une chance incroyable d'avoir pu recevoir Simine Vazir euh, pour le reproducibility. Et donc dans cette conférence, Simine nous présente un projet donc portant sur les facteurs de qualité qui permettraient d'évaluer la qualité euh, d'une un, recherche. Donc en effet, en effet hein, quand on lit un article, il est important de savoir dans quelle mesure on peut considérer que euh, comment on peut évaluer cette qualité vis-à-vis -vis de l'éthique, de l'intégrité scientifique, de la robustesse euh, des interférences que, que l'on va faire, euh, l'intérêt théorique, euh, l'intérêt pratique, etc. Donc dans cette conférence, il nous présente les dates de la recherche euh, qui seront mises en place dans, euh, dans le futur en tout cas on l'espère, mmh. afin de développer des mesures fiables de la qualité euh, de la recherche. Euh, donc c'est un vaste projet euh, qui, on espère, marchera. Ouais. Voilà. Donc en description de la vidéo, vous retrouverez le diapo euh, de la présentation, euh, ainsi que d'autres liens pour soit contacter Simine, soit pour la suivre par exemple sur Twitter. Et donc tout de suite, la vidéo. Hi everybody, and thanks for being here. Uh, so today we are uh, truly honored to host Simin for our first uh, English-speaking session of our reproducibility event. Um, and yeah, it, it is such a privilege. So uh, I'm going to go for the uh, formal way by introducing uh, our speaker to uh, anyone who might not know her. <laughs> so uh, Simin is a professor at the University of Melbourne, Australia. And um, yeah, I'm quite nervous because uh, it's you're quite a, an impressive person. Uh, but yeah, she started her career by uh, studying uh, self-knowledge accuracy. And uh, she soon became what we would call in France uh, a pont, but uh, what could be translated in English as a distinguished researcher, I guess. Uh, it's shown in the, well, in the long record of uh, honors, distinctions, and award um, she received, uh, a long list that I looked up uh, yesterday. And yeah, it's quite impressive. But more relevant for the, today's talk, um, Simin Vazir greatly contributed to the field of meta-science. Uh, she is a co-founder of the Society for Improvement of uh, Psychological Science, the SIPS. Uh, she is also uh, editor-in-chief of um, Collabra Psychology, a journal that uh, aims to emphasize method, rigor, openness, and transparency. Um, she published a lot of really important articles uh, on the confidence crisis, um, on uh, issues such as um, transparency and openness in scientific culture or um, statistical power in major psychology journals, which we talked about uh, in a, a previous session, repressive session. Um, but uh, yeah, and um, so really, really important uh, articles. I think few scientists uh, contributed as much as uh, Simin did to uh, yeah, to the, improvement, to the improvement of psychological science. And that is why it is a, a, a really a big honor uh, to have you with us. Um, yeah, as I often say, uh, we are not overly strict with the format and uh, the rules of the talk. It should be like a 40 minutes long talk and 20 minutes for Q&A, but uh, we'll head up to you. Uh, I won't be with a stopwatch to interrupt you while you talk. So, uh, so please feel free to talk as much as you want and we will adapt to, to that. So. Uh, Yeah, one last time, thanks for being here, and uh, please go ahead, Simin. Great, thanks so much. I'm really excited to be here and to speak to you all. And yeah, feel free to interrupt if you want to ask a question. Definitely, this doesn't need to be a formal talk by any means. And actually, the talk I'm going to give is a, a very kind of open-ended, um, something I've been working on very recently, so I don't have a lot of answers. So actually, it would be great to get a lot of discussion going. Also, feel free to ask your questions in French if you'd like. I speak French fluently, but only the, my vocabulary is limited to what I speak with my family, so I won't recognize any scientific or technical language, but I can just ask for clarification for those. So feel free, French or English is fine. Um, okay, so I'll share my screen.
-hmm. Okay, so what I'm going to be talking about today, as I mentioned, it's um, some pretty recent things I've been thinking about, and my thinking has been influenced a lot by my graduate students, Julie Bodassini and Sarah Schiavoni, as well as my collaborator, Fiona Fiddler, and other collaborators, but especially these three. Um, so a lot of the ideas I'll be talking about today are not just mine, but inf influenced by discussions with all of these people. And what I've been thinking about is, is what it means to evaluate research quality. And this is something I think a lot about as a journal editor. Um, and uh, in, when I teach research methods, things like that, um, all of those situations, we talk about quality, but we don't really actually have very concrete or specific ideas about what we mean. Like, what is a journal supposed to select for? What is What does quality mean to different journals and so on? Those questions are left kind of vague and, and not really specified. Um, and so what I'm going to argue today is that we need to get a lot more concrete about what we mean by quality, and that's going to have a lot of benefits for science and for the public. And so I'm just going to cut to the chase and give kind of the bottom line of what I'm going to argue today. And first, I'm going to set up a problem, which is that um, right now, the way peer review works, there is a lot of value created by peer review, but that value is mostly wasted. We don't really um, capitalize on it and use it as much as we could. And as a result, readers have very few clues to quality. They don't benefit from a lot of the information that's generated by peer review. Um, and so, Instead, they have to rely on cues like journal prestige. And many readers do this. Many, we know, we know that search committees often do this, other kinds of committees that are choosing who to give grants or awards to. And that creates perverse incentives to try to do what will get into the highest prestige journal rather than do what is best for science or highest quality work you can. And in parallel to these problems emerging, there's the rise of preprints, which is really pressing the issue of how do we know if a particular research article is high quality without relying on journal prestige. So I think this problem was, was growing anyway, and then preprints came along and kind of really accentuated the need for more information about how to tell which um, findings, which articles are more trustworthy and which ones are more preliminary. And what I'm gonna propose as a solution is something I call quality factors, which is kind of quantitative numerical um, information about multiple dimensions of quality that are shared not just within the peer review process, but shared more openly um, and can be updated over time so that any reader of an article can also see what experts thought about the qualities of the paper. I'm going to sometimes slip into using this in the singular like quality factor or single quality, but really I mean multiple different dimensions of quality. Um, and so any paper could be read by a number of experts who scored on several different dimensions and that those scores are available for any reader to see. And that would help us earn more public trust and credibility because it would be clear that we have signals to, as to which findings are more trustworthy or less, and we don't just rely on whether it was published in a top journal. Um, and this would also have another side effect of helping to realign incentives for researchers. Instead of being motivated to get into the best possible journal, we would be motivated to um, get the highest ratings we can on the dimensions we care about. And because there would be multiple dimensions, that might be different for different people. Okay, so let me back up a little bit. This is an outline of what I'll talk about today. I'm going to go relatively quickly through some of these things, especially because I don't have a lot of answers for some of them. But I want to put them all up here to give us some kind of material for discussion of what are some of the challenges we'd need to solve to make this happen. So first, I'll, I'll go a little bit more into detail about why we need something like quality factors. Um, how would we create it? What would be in those measures? And then if I have time, I'll talk a little bit about some ongoing projects, but I'll just say up front, I don't have a lot of data on this. Um, but I have some illustrations of like projects that tackle a piece of this. And then I have a few ideas, but really looking for more ideas about how we can get uptake on this kind of thing and how we prevent abuse in this system. Um, I also want to mention, I can't see anybody or see the chat. So if somebody does have questions, just unmute yourself and let me know, and then I'll, we'll go from there. Um, okay, so the big problem, I think, for a scientific field to establish itself as having credibility and earning trust is to show that it can differentiate between more solid, sure findings and more preliminary, unsure findings. And uh, you know, we, as a scientific community, have different ways of doing this, but I don't think any of them are particularly good. We've, we've developed different kind of heuristics or crutches we can lean on to decide which findings are more solid than others. But especially this replication crisis um, in psychology, I think has highlighted some of the problems with those heuristics. So for example, 
one thing we teach uh, our students is that there's this pyramid of evidence with systematic reviews, meta-analyses, et cetera, at the top. But as we've learned from replication crisis and many other, you know, a lot of other work before that, um, if the bottom of the pyramid has problems and the top of the pyramid is going to have problems, it doesn't really save us to aggregate or do reviews if the individual research findings are not solid and we can't tell which ones are more or less solid. Another potential solution is to rely on what stands the test of time, what makes it into textbooks, what gets a lot of citations. But again, I think that the, the last 10 years in psychology have shown that even the things that are kind of the most famous, the most established, um, that are built on, that their entire careers built on, or labs and, and research lines built on, don't necessarily, um, aren't necessarily more solid than the ones that get less attention. There's things like awards that may help us pick out, you know, the very most something findings, maybe the most solid, maybe the most exciting, um, but that doesn't really work, doesn't help us very much for differentiating among the rest of the, the, the you know, 99% of the research that doesn't get such awards. And then there's the thing that many of us use, and certainly many of our universities use in evaluating us, which is the prestige of the journal that a, a, a research finding is published in. And that we end up using that a lot, even if we don't really um, believe there's a strong correlation. It's just partly for lack of anything else to use, um, and partly because everyone else uses it, and so we have to respond to the incentives and so on. But in the last few decades, there's been actually a growing movement to really push back against this tendency to use journal prestige as a heuristic for the quality of an individual research paper. There's been the Leiden Manifesto, the Hong Kong Principles, and um, the one I'm going to talk about a little bit more is the DORA Decla Declaration on Research, research Assessment. Um, and the Declaration on Research Assessment has been signed by several thousand individuals and organizations. I picked out a few in France. I wasn't sure looking at the list which ones are kind of the most well-known or would resonate. There's a lot, there's 54 organizations in France that have signed DORA and about 1,200 individuals. And then my own university, not in France, the University of Melbourne, signed this declaration recently. And the core of DORA was captured in this tweet with three kind of key components to DORA. And the one I'm gonna talk about and emphasize today is this idea of that we should assess research on its own merits, not based on the journal that it was published in or, or the fame of the researchers and so on. Um, and I completely endorse this idea. I think it's a really great idea, but I think it's much more difficult than it sounds on the surface. You know, evaluate research on its own merits sounds relatively straightforward, but I think when you try to think about how to implement this and especially how to implement it at scale, it becomes much more complicated. So what does it mean to assess research on its own merits? And perhaps the first and most obvious answer is that we should read the full manuscript, right? Evaluate, read the research and evaluate it that way. But the problem is this doesn't work in a lot of contexts. So first of all, it doesn't work at scale if you need to read hundreds and hundreds of papers to decide, for example, which job candidates to invite for an interview or which um, applicants to give an award or a grant to when there are dozens or hundreds of applicants. Um, it doesn't work when we're evaluating researchers outside of our own area of expertise. So we can read the manuscript, but that won't really help us evaluate the quality. Um, it doesn't help us when we need to act quickly, make a decision, and we don't have time, even if it's not a huge amount of reading, um, we may not have time to read all of the relevant evidence. So there are many contexts where it would be really useful to have, excuse me, I'm going to sneeze at some point, um, to have some way, some quick and reliable way of assessing the quality of, or qualities of different um, research articles quickly without having to read each one ourselves, and especially when we can't evaluate them ourselves. Um, and so you might ask, well, isn't evaluating research on its own merits what journals do? We've outsourced this to journals. They do the hard work of reading the article, getting experts to read it, and then we find out if it's a high quality article or not. Well, as you might have guessed, um, and uh, you might already have thought about this a lot, it sounds like based on the topics that you all have talked about in your journal club, um, there's a lot of problems with this. Um, if we think of journal-based peer review as a measure of research quality the way that we as psychologists or social scientists would evaluate any other measure of a construct, it leaves a lot to be desired, right? This is not how you would design an, or operationalize um, research quality if you were doing it for a research study. But there's a few problems. One is that, for example, most journals don't actually have a definition of quality. They don't explicitly state in the kind of operational definition what they're looking for, what they're prioritizing. If they have you know, a 90% rejection rate, what is the difference that they're looking for in that 10%? There's no explicit definition of what they count as high quality. 
Another problem is that the information they get from reviewers um, is mostly open-ended narrative descriptions uh, or evaluations of the quality of the papers, but this is hard to reduce into numerical quantitative ratings, um, which makes it hard to um, compare ratings between reviewers or understand what's factoring into ultimate decisions to accept or reject. Um, and then those rich narrative evaluations are reduced to a binary decision. All that the public finds out is whether the paper was accepted or not, or actually it doesn't even find out about rejections, right? We just find out the papers that were given accept decisions. So all of that rich information that's generated in peer review is reduced to just, yes, it passed our threshold of whatever it is we value for quality. And then um, the evaluations themselves are kept hidden. So all of that information we could get, even though it's, it's even in its like rich open-ended form that's maybe hard to quantify, that would be useful still for readers to be able to access, but that's not shared with readers. And because all of this is not transparent, there's no way to hold the process accountable or validate the process and check that it really is tracking something um, like quality or whatever it is the journal wants to be tracking and, and prioritizing. Um, so this led me to write a critical um, piece recently about why I think peer-reviewed scientific journals don't really do their job. And I wrote it in a public um, outlet because I think that there's a huge mismatch between what the public thinks that journal-based peer review does and what how little we know about how, what it actually does. Um, I think that many um, non-scientists have the intuition that journals do quality control and that you have to be above a clear threshold to get into a journal, when in reality, it's a lot more fuzzy than that. We don't really know what it takes to get accepted a journal. We don't know what it means for a paper to be accepted in a journal and so on. And I should say a lot of these ideas were inspired by this really great paper by Hasten and Bright called Is Peer Review a Good Idea? I feel like I'd been thinking about these things, but they express them in a really um, clear and well articulated way as philosophers often do. Um, so if we think about, okay, but let's think about what the public expects peer review to do. And maybe the public's expectations are actually a good thing to think about. Maybe that's what we should be aiming for. This idea that peer review should provide some kind of assurance that the paper is at least you know, good enough on certain dimensions. Um, well, one is that probably it should assess multiple dimensions of quality. Probably there is not one single thing that just is a high quality paper. There are a lot of different reasons why a paper might be high quality. Maybe it's really pushing the boundaries of what we know. It's really groundbreaking, but very tentative, very preliminary. It needs to be followed up on. We shouldn't be too sure of it, but still that's a high quality paper of a certain type. Or maybe it is very definitive, it is very rigorous, but it's very incremental. It's just, it's taking something we already thought we knew and showing, yes, this is definitely the case. Um, those are very different kinds of high quality papers and it would be useful to readers to know why was this paper accepted or why was it deemed high quality? Was it because it was more groundbreaking or more definitive? And, or there could be any number of other reasons why a paper would be deemed high quality. Um, and this, the, all of these dimensions should be rated on, in a continuous fashion, right? It's not just, it's, it's good to know if it's above or below threshold, but it would be even better to know, you know, how great was it or how terrible was it? Um, and for those, those ratings, those evaluations to be transparently reported so that other people outside of the peer review process could benefit from those expert evaluations. Um, and it would be ideal if those ratings could be updated over time. So if we later find out that actually a particular method has this major artifact that we didn't know about before, we could go back and update our ratings of papers using that method in terms of their methodological rigor or risk of artifact or something like that. Um, so basically, I think peer review should produce quantitative numerical ratings on multiple dimensions that could be combined into quality factors, um, and they could be combined differently depending on our goals. So maybe um, one reader wants only the most groundbreaking stuff that's gonna blow their mind. And so they're gonna select which papers to read based on that. Another reader wants only the really safe stuff that they can absolutely count on. So the nice thing about this approach would be that different readers, different users could get whatever they want out of it because all of the information would be there. Um, so this would change the incentive structure for authors from wanting to get it accepted into a prestigious journal. And once it's in, you're solid. Everyone's gonna think it's high quality to wanting to make sure you survive this ongoing and multidimensional evaluation and come out looking strong. And this could be mean different things for different researchers. Getting, it, getting high scores on particular dimensions might be more important for some researchers or for some dimensions than others. 
Um, also, this would take power away from journals, which right now thrive on being given kind of all the responsibility for deciding what are the high quality papers. They're treated as if they're the, the gatekeepers and the only people that can kind of uh, sanction a paper and say, this is a high quality paper. But actually, it's our expertise that decides what's a high quality paper. And there's no reason that it needs to happen in secret and, and be a static one time binary thing. So the way this started was actually uh, uh, an email from me to Chris Fraley many, many years ago. And uh, I heard that you all read the NPAC Factor paper in an earlier journal club. So this is actually, this email is what started our NPAC Factor project. And it was because of a comment that Chris Fraley wrote on Brent Donnellan's blog about how we should really have a consumer reports for journals that evaluates the quality of the papers they publish. And back in 2012, I thought this is a great idea. Um, I think it's interesting for me to look back and think about how long I've been working on this kind of idea and how naive I was when I started thinking this wouldn't be hard to do, right? And so this took several years to turn into any concrete thing. And even then it was only one dimension, it was just sample size. Um, and that was quite a bit of work. And so since then I've been working on expanding that to look at other characteristics of published papers and, and try to get um, good measures of different aspects of their quality. And so that's what I'll be talking about today. And incidentally, this was framed as kind of a way to evaluate and hold journals accountable. But I think that I'm interested in, in journals because of my role in like professional societies and as an editor and things like that. But for most purposes, actually, what we really want to know is the quality of individual research papers. I think there are interesting questions to ask. We can aggregate those paper quality ratings and ask questions about journals and does prestige track quality and things like that. I'm interested in those questions too, but probably the more useful version of this is applying it to the paper level rather than the journal level. So if we had quality factors available for each paper, giving us information about what experts think about the quality of the paper on a range of dimensions, who would use that information? So one is even people who have nothing to do with science, but are just interested members of the public. And I think we've all been these people sometimes when we want to research, you know, maybe a treatment for our dog or our uh, friend or whether it's worth it to go on a particular diet or things like that. We may be reading a literature that is not, we have no particular expertise in, and it would be really useful to know more about not just was it published in a peer reviewed journal or which peer reviewed journal, but like what did the experts actually think of it on different dimensions. Of course, journalists and policymakers would also find it very useful to get all this expert information, right? This is what they go out and seek when they need to make a decision about whether to cover a finding or, or implement it in public policy. So having this information at their fingertips would be extremely useful to them. But even within the scientific community, as I mentioned, committees are in a position to have to make decisions among a lot of different candidates in a short amount of time and don't have time to read the full manuscripts, even if they have the expertise, um, they would benefit a lot from having the, these summary judgments made publicly available. Um, scientists in neighboring disciplines. So again, I think we've all been in this position where we're trying to read a paper in another discipline because it's related to our work, but we don't have the context and background to necessarily tell if it's a high quality paper and we should trust it or not. It'd be great to know what people within that field think. Even within our discipline, I think there are times when it's hard to evaluate. The, the authors used a particular method that I know there are some pitfalls, but I don't remember what they are. Or I don't know what they are. Um, I would love to know what people with more expertise than me think. And even when it's exactly in my sub, my specific area of expertise, I would still rather know what other people think than just rely on my own evaluation, right? If I could also access the quantitative ratings of a number of other experts on different dimensions, that would make my judgment even more informed than just relying on my own opinion. So I think there's a huge range of potential benefits to having this information available. So, excuse me, Simin, can I um, use this occasion to interrupt you and ask a question, Absolutely. please? Yeah. Um, I was wondering if, if these suggestions that um, you describe now are meant to be applied in a perspective where everything is published, or mm -hmm. is there still somewhere at some point a decision to publish a paper or not? Yeah, I think if we had these quality factors, we wouldn't need a decision to publish a paper or not. So I would prefer that we separate publication from evaluation and that um, that 
we just publish everything first and then evaluation comes after that. But even if we don't get to that world yet, we can still implement quality factors even on published work and post-publication peer review. So to me, they're, they do go hand in hand that it, quality factors would make it obsolete to have this accept reject decision, right? Um, but even if journals continue to insist on, you know, doing peer review in secret and making this accept reject decision, nothing's stopping us from then coming along and assigning more reviewers and, and giving getting quantitative ratings of those papers. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I think I've been quite negative about journal-based peer review, even though I spend a lot of my time um, as an editor and reviewer and in the traditional system. So I obviously think it has some value, but I do think it's quite broken relative to what it ought to do, what it could do, um, what the public expects it to do, which I think are very reasonable expectations. But I do want to emphasize that what reviewers are doing in that journal-based peer review system is so valuable. Um, there's a lot of valuable information in the reviewer's heads. It's getting poured onto paper or computer screen during the review process. But most of that value is wasted or even exploited by for-profit publishers and not being shared, not being turned into information that other people could use as well. So all of that time and energy and expertise that's put into peer review, um, you know, a lot more could be done with it. So if we saved it instead of just disappearing after the binary decision, shared it publicly in a way that protects reviewers. So I, I'm happy to talk about this, but I don't think we need to identify the reviewers, but we can still share the content of the reviews. We could ask reviewers to quantify in addition to the open-ended um, reviews, ask them to do some numerical ratings of different dimensions, and then aggregate it and show it to people who could use that information. And we should not just trust that this process is valid, just like we shouldn't trust that the old system is valid, we should validate it. And because this would happen out in the open, it would be much easier to look at, examine the validity of this process and improve it. Okay, so why do we need a quality factor or quality factors? Because journals seem to refuse to uh, provide it, to provide information about the specific qualities of any given paper that led them to accept that paper. What were the things that made this paper good and how good was it and so on. Um, so the next thing I'll talk about is how do we create it? And I'll talk about kind of different intuitions we might have about how we would, should go about measuring the quality of um, individual papers. So one is there's a common kind of argument that you can't put a number on quality and any quality measure will be an oversimplification. It will leave out things that can't be quantified and even some that can. It'll have unintended consequences. And all of those things are true. I don't think they should stop us though because we can only incentivize what we can measure. And so whatever is being measured now is what's going to be incentivized. So if we don't try to measure the things we want to reward, the qualities we want more of, then we'll measure and reward other things. And so I think even an imperfect measure as long as we take into account and try to mitigate the unintended consequences and the fact that it's going to it's going to be imperfect, I think that's still a step in the right direction. And I think some of that mitigation is making sure that we have multiple different qualities, multiple dimensions of quality, and so therefore many different ways of creating a summary number out of those. There isn't just one metric that is quality. Um, I think that'll help mitigate some of the problems with the imperfections of any measure. So I'm not sure we can do it, but I think we can't afford not to do it. I think the current system is creating a lot of perverse incentives. It's not measuring quality, but we pretend that it is, and we can do better than that system. And anyway, as I mentioned, I think preprints and this whole movement towards separating publication from evaluation, which I support, I think it's a good thing, and it's going to force us to come up with a new system to evaluate things that doesn't depend on just a secret um, process with a binary decision as an outcome. So I think it's really an opportunity. The, the problem of preprints is to me a really good threat to the current system, the current reliance on journal prestige. Preprints don't allow us to do that. And so they provide an opportunity to do better. So how do we measure quality? Well, this is really a social science problem, right? We have an abstract construct, paper quality, that's hard to measure, not directly observable. Judgments are imperfect and bias is a major threat. This sounds like a lot of our social science work, right? So how do we tackle this? Well, one thing I've run into is that it's really tempting to think that there's an objective measure of quality that we don't have to rely on subjective judgment. And I'm gonna argue that I think that's a mistake. I think that objective measures are gonna be worse than subjective judgment. Ultimately, we need both and we should kind of triangulate across both, but I think we need to resist the temptation to put objective measures on a pedestal. 
Um, so I'll go on a slight tangent talking about some of my earlier work on personality that, um, that was mentioned earlier. So in addition to human personality research, I also did a bit of research on animal personality. And in the animal personality literature, there's a tendency to put quote unquote objective measures, behavioral measures on a pedestal and say that is the true kind of direct measure of personality is how much an individual, you know, gets in fights or grooms another individual or um, runs away fearfully and things like that. And so instead of getting these subjective judgments from maybe keepers or researchers who know the animals well, no, that's not, that's too soft. We're going to sit there and count, have researchers count the number of behaviors um, in, in our observations, the number of times an individual does a behavior. And that feels so much more objective. But the research suggests it's actually quite a bit worse. Those, the objective measures of behavior are less reliable and the signs point to less valid than the subjective ratings by people who know the individuals well. And the same is true in human personality. I spent a lot of time in my personality work um, recording human behavior and spending years and years having hundreds of coders listen to the recordings and code actual behavior. And even as someone who's a big fan of that approach, I would say, if you had to choose, that is the worst approach. If you can get questionnaire measures, from people who know the person well and, their, and themselves, that's a better, if you had to choose one or the other, the questionnaire measures are gonna do better. Even though they feel more subjective, there's so much rich information in the raters' heads that we can't capture with just short bursts of observation. And the same reasons that that's true also apply to measuring quality of research papers. And those are things like, for example, to get an objective measure, you often have to get very far from the richness of the construct you're interested in. So for example, instead of measuring extroversion, we might measure how many words were spoken in the time frame that we observed. And extroversion just isn't just the number of words spoken. There's a lot more to extroversion that a questionnaire could pick up on, but objective, quote unquote, objective measures won't pick up on. Objective measures are often much harder to collect than subjective ratings. That's more of a practical issue, but I think people overlook the problem with that. And because they're so time intensive to collect, you actually get worse reliability because you can't get as many observations or as many observers um, as you could for a questionnaire type approach. And the most important thing maybe is that objective measures aren't necessarily objective. It's actually quite hard to get inter-rater agreement even on objective measures or even to define something like a chimpanzee running away from another chimpanzee. It turns out as soon as you start trying to code it, you run into all these gray area cases. And if you let the raters, the observers, use their subjective judgment, you get much better results than if you force them to stick to a, a strict definition. It turns out that oftentimes, um, we are quite good at taking context into account and making a good judgment. And I think the same is going to be true for quality. If we had these quote unquote objective measures and stuck to them without taking into account of each paper on a case by case basis, we would miss a lot of information. So I think that there's no substitute for expert judgment. We can't reduce the quality of a paper to just factors that can be coded objectively. Um, we need experts to look at the full paper and make a holistic judgment of the qualities of the paper. But those judgments should be validated. Um, and some of the ways that we could validate expert judgments would be looking at things like agreement among judges to get a sense of the reliability of the judgments, whether the judgments predict outcomes like what we traditionally care about, like getting into top journals or impact. Now, it's, it's hard to interpret those if you don't trust those as measures of quality, but hopefully we can get enough different ones that there should be some correspondence between the expert judgments and these outcomes. And of course, correlations with objective characteristics. I think that is one piece of the puzzle. We should be coding some objective characteristics and making sure that expert judgments of qualities track to some extent what's going on in the actual content of the paper. Um, but really this means that we need to triangulate. We need both objective or quote unquote objective and subjective measures and look at their correspondence. So we have this problem. Um, there's no magic bullet or no direct pipeline to quality. We have to do it the hard way, which we're used to in the social sciences, right? We have to spend a lot of time thinking about how to define the construct, developing measures that are each going to be imperfect, and then triangulating across the measures. So I've come up with kind of three categories of ways to operationalize the quality of a paper. So the first is coding these objective characteristics of a paper, and I've talked about some of the pros and cons of that. And then the other two are taking more subjective approaches using expert judgment. So the second is still asking the experts to rate specific qualities that we've enumerated. Um, 
And then the third is asking experts to just rate how good the paper is holistically in a single on a single dimension, which I don't like very much because that's you know basically going back to what journals are doing, except reject kind of um, simplified decision, and we lose a lot of information about on which dimensions is the paper good. But if we're going to do number two and have experts read the entire paper and rate a bunch of dimensions, we might as well also ask them, well, and overall, how good do you think the paper is? So I'm going to mostly combine approaches two and three. So approach one is the more objective one, and then two and three are, are the more relying on expert subjective judgment. So the kind of meat of this, and I might not get much past this bullet point, I'll, I'll warn you, this might be the last part I get to because I really want to make sure we have time for discussion, is what should it measure? What should go into a quality factor measure in psychology specifically? And one thing I want to emphasize is I think this needs to look different and be created independently in each field and maybe even in different subfields. So what I'm going to be talking about is based on my experience in social and personality psychology, and it may miss some important aspects of quality that are relevant for different subfields, certainly for different fields. Um, so in thinking about what dimensions of quality should we count, should go into something like this, it's really hard to think to know where to look. So, you know, if you look at, for example, journals, explicit policies and, and statements about what they're looking for, that's not very useful. There's not very much on journal websites or editorials that define what they mean by quality. There's a lot of kind of catchphrases and buzzwords, but not a lot of concrete kind of constructs that you could operationalize. So we could look at places like where we explicitly state what we think makes good science. So things like undergraduate textbooks or research methods courses, um, our stated scientific values, what, what we say in our mission statements, for example, for our professional societies, or what society at large expects uh, of us and thinks that scientific values are. All of those, I think, are good sources of like what should be valued and rewarded in science. And so based on these kinds of criteria um, and a few different you know, sources, I came up with some dimensions that I think are relevant in evaluating qualities in psychology. Basically, these are kind of I'm trying to think of different ways that a paper could be really good or really bad or wanting. Um, and so I, I first kind of wrote down all the dimensions I could think of and then pared some down and you know, went through this iterative process. And then I ended up with a list that I thought was relatively comprehensive. And I tried to organize these different dimensions in some way. Um, and what I came up with was that there's the transparency stuff, like can you even understand what was done? And that kind of comes before. It's not even quality in itself, but it's almost a necessary condition to evaluate quality. So it's relevant for quality, so I kept it in there, but it kind of has a little asterisk that it's almost, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition for quality. Then there's validity related factors that speak to the credibility of a paper, um, should you trust its results. And then there's what I call the substantial contribution factors that are about the importance of the paper. So not necessarily how rigorous is it, but like, or is, or is the kind of research itself, but what about the, the contribution that it's making? How does it fit in with the literature? Is it providing a new tool or is it providing a really valuable data set? Does it have applied value, et cetera? And then I had two qualities that I couldn't figure out how to group with others. So that kind of stands alone, intellectual humility and ethical soundness. Um, and so then I further, um, categorize these. And under credibility signals, I put another thing, prior plausibility, which I think is interesting to evaluate. It's not a quality dimension because you can have high quality work with low prior plausibility, but it is relevant to credibility. So for completeness, I kind of stuck it in there. And I also tried to think about which of these dimensions are more necessary and which of them are more optional. So you could have a very good paper, even if you're low on that dimension. And so I filled in the boxes that I thought you really have to have these. There's no reason not to have these. And if you don't, it can't be a good paper. So calibrated conclusions is one of those for me because even if you have flaws in your methods or you know in your theory, things like that, as long as your con conclusions are calibrated, there's no excuse to not calibrate your conclusions. Not say, look, these findings are really tentative. We couldn't get a large enough sample or we couldn't use the best available methods or so on. And the other one is ethical soundness. And then I put the transparency comprehensibility stuff in like pretty, like somewhat filled in because I think you need to have a certain minimum level of that to have a quality paper. Um, I devised a scale, a preliminary scale that we've piloted a little bit and I'm planning to kind of revise it more and kind of again, go through iterations of this to try to get a good measure that gets at these different qualities. And I'm also very open to adding or removing qualities. One change I've already made since this version 
is the substantial contribution there. I crammed in all the different ways the paper can make a substantial contribution into number 12. I want to split those up. I want to know, is the paper good because of its theory or ideas, because of the raw data, because it introduces a new tool or method, or because it has that potential for application. I really would think there would be a lot of value in breaking those out. Um, and I think I might pause here and maybe we can have some discussion. If people are curious about these other three bullet points, I can, I'm happy to share my few little thoughts I have on those, but I, I think your thoughts are just as oh, probably fleshed out as mine on, on those topics. So I'm gonna stop sharing for now so that we can see each other and have a discussion. Well, thanks. Uh, if anyone has a question, do not hesitate to just unmute and uh, ask your question straight away. Um, Well, I'm going to start maybe. Uh, I, I, it just made me think of something. Uh, I, I don't know if you've ever heard of the, the I think the name is uh, the Self Journal of Science. Uh, and it's uh, like a, an online journal uh, with uh, like this process of evaluation of, um, of articles, which is really, um, I would say, alive. Uh, I, I might share a, a link because I, I, searched, I searched it during your talk because it made me think of this. And like there is this uh, this evaluation of the paper that is done by uh, anyone who wants to do it. Uh, so it's based on it's critic based. Um, and yeah, it's I would love to see a link. I don't know this. Yeah, I'm sending it right away. Uh, so it's a link to the article that presents uh, the concept of this uh, evaluation. And so it's been rated like uh, this article has reached scientific standards six over nine. This article still needs revision to three over nine. Uh, so yeah, th that might be uh, something of interest. Uh, wow, yeah, that's really interesting for this project. And there is also, um, yeah, you you already know it, uh, I, I'm sure, but uh, the uh, the uh, open peer review process uh, that, that is yeah. quite interesting. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I, I I don't know. Um, what do you think, maybe, uh, of this uh, open peer review process that is done, like with uh, F. Thousand, I, I don't know. Yeah, or meta psychology also does it. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's great. So it's, I think the most extreme version of it is where uh, authors upload their papers to a public repository like SciArchive, for example, and then the journal really just organizes peer review out in the open in live, live time. So as the reviewers write their comments, anyone can see them and their comments on the preprint. Um, and then in the end, the journal might invite specific reviewers, but they also use reviews that come in that are unsolicited if they want to. And I know actually PLOS journals, some of them at least, have also started telling editors, hey, you should feel free to use any comments you find on, on the preprint, for example, if they're helpful or relevant, even if they weren't from reviewers that you solicited. Um, and then in metapsychology, for example, they do in the end make a, a accept, reject binary decision, but even if they reject it, all of that information created by the peer review process is still out there. So the kind of final decision is not that important. It gives us a signal of what the editor thought and, uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Okay, I think I'm okay now. Oh, one more second. Sorry. Okay, yeah. So it gives us an idea of what the editor thinks in the end, if it's above or below threshold. <clears throat> I'll let you talk for a minute now. <laughs> Can I ask a question, please? Yeah. Oh, uh, this is Leila again. I um I really like the idea, for instance, of um having reviews somehow just come in by themselves without being solicited. And uh, mm -hmm. I think it can provide really a, um, quite a valuable input for the authors, for the researchers, because we would usually really like to um, have such a thing before submitting our articles, but sometimes yeah. it's not, you know, people are so busy and it's not easy to ask them all, oh, can, can you have a look at my article? I'm not giving you anything, you know, for, for that work, but just I'd like to have your opinion. And yeah. um, but there's a, still an issue that somehow um, concerns me is that with this perspective, we would generate so much 
metadata about a manuscript. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the quantity of information about one piece of work would literally yeah. explode. So right. I think that potentially that would be really very difficult to handle. And it would, um, in a way, make it even maybe more difficult to have an opinion about a manuscript. You see what I mean? Yeah. Because even yeah. very good experts are not always in agreement with one another about the same piece of work. Yeah. Do you think that might be, um, you know, hinder your? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think my first answer is that I don't think that. More, yeah, I think that more information might be useless, but I don't think it'll be harmful. And I would, I would kind of leave open the possibility that in the future we'll devise ways to extract kind of summaries of that information in ways we can't imagine now. But I, I share the feeling that like it's just overwhelming and it might be a lot of work for nothing. So that's one of the reasons why I really want quantitative ratings. I don't just want open-ended narrative reviews. And I think even, even just a small, one small tweak we could make right now to the traditional system is adding some quantitative ratings to the reviewer form. There are a few journals that do this, but they're like, how good was the paper from zero to a hundred? And you have no instructions about what, you know, is 50 like fine or is 50 terrible or, you know, um, so having more structured, more guided, like a questionnaire, like you would de design to measure any other construct where it's easy to understand what you're getting at, what the scores mean and so on. Um, and I think if we had those quantitative ratings, it would be easier to summarize the information. You'd lose a lot of the richness of narrative reviews and those could still exist. But if you also had the quantitative ratings, it would at least be something. And there's one platform that, that does this, um, that it kind of does a lot of the things I was talking about for biology. It's called pre-review. And what they do is they organize, if authors want to get their paper reviewed, they post it to BioArchive, the preprint server for biology, and then they tell pre-review, hey, I'd like to get peer reviews on my paper. They have to create an account in pre-review. And then other members of the scientific community can create an account as well and can go in and review papers. And then they present the summary of how many people have reviewed it. And if they use a review form, it's flexible, so there's different review forms. If the reviewers use a review form with quantitative, ratings, then it presents like a distribution of all the scores the paper has gotten. So if you were like a journalist or just a, an interested person, you could go there, say, oh, this paper, I want to see all the papers have gotten at least five reviews. And then I get a quantitative summary of like, oh, there's a lot of disagreement about this paper or all, all the reviewers agree that it's high on this dimension and low on that dimension. So I think that would make it a lot less overwhelming. Um, they're providing more structure. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I have a related question. Hi. Mm -hmm. um, I was uh, thinking about the previous, like you said, um, I, I'm, I'm always wondering how comes and what do you think uh, explains that most of the proofs are not evaluated by the community? And I, I was thinking about what do you think uh, are the incentive for us as researchers to evaluate um, other people's work, because to, to be a to be a, a reviewer, we have to I don't know accept to do the, the job, and it's time consuming and so on. And why do you think that so few people review and evaluate preprints? Yeah, I think right now there's no incentive to review and evaluate preprints, and no one's even asking people to do it. And I think that we do need some kind of top down or authority to say this is a good way to spend your time and this would count in the same way that reviewing for journals does. And right now there's no mechanism for putting anything on your CV related to reviewing preprints. At least with journals, you could put on your CV that you reviewed for these journals. Maybe you get invited to be on the editorial board, you get that recognition. So I think what we need is a system with a bit of structure. It can't just be a free-for-all because yeah, there, there's no incentive and, and there would be other problems with a free-for-all. But if you had a system where you create an account, it's linked to your ORCID, for example, or some way to identify you as a member of the scientific community, and it keeps track of how many reviews you do. Maybe there's even a system where people can give a thumbs up to your review if it was especially helpful. You could develop reputation as a reviewer. Um, and you could then say, I, I reviewed this many papers on the, the this preprint server in this month. The other neat thing about that system is that it could, there could be the, the moderators of that, the service could assign 
papers to reviewers just like editors do. So there is one useful function, well, more than one probably, but one very useful function of journals is that they do help match reviewers to authors and make sure that every paper gets looked at by at least one or a few people. And I think there's a role for that. I think we don't want, I don't want those people to be gatekeepers and say the paper can't get published, but I do like the idea of having moderators kind of matching things. And in a system with the technology we have now, there's no reason we couldn't do it even a system where reviewers, let's say all of us as, as members of the scientific community say, we'll dedicate one day a month or maybe even one day every two months or whatever's realistic to reviewing. We schedule that day ahead of time so that the moderators know, oh, this person with this expertise is gonna be available this date. They pull four or five papers, maybe that's unrealistic for one day, but however many papers, assign them to them to do on that day. They, the authors get a much faster turnaround time because you know when it's gonna happen. Um, and you're doing a service, right? So then everybody could show that they I did this many days or half days of reviewing for this service. Um, and maybe I got this many thumbs up for my reviews. I think being able to kind of concretely show what service you did would, would help a bit, provide an incentive to review preprints. But I think ultimately, as long as we have the old system, people aren't gonna have time left over for this new system. So this may be a reason why we do need to kind of uh, crush the old system before a new one could could survive in its place. Or at least we need people to kind of not see themselves as having this obligation to review for these non-transparent and for-profit journals and say, you could give that time in a much more pro-social way. This question made me think of something like in a, in the early sanitary uh, crisis, uh, there, there was like I think it was Moin Syed, but I'm not sure uh, who did this uh, this preprint. Um, he, he did like a, a Google sheet uh, with uh, all the preprints that were published on COVID-19, and mm -hmm. uh, he asked um, openly individuals to uh, publish peer reviews uh, of, the, yeah. of, the, of the preprints. And I think at the beginning of the crisis, it did quite work well. Like uh, a lot of, uh, of researchers uh, played the game and it was quite interesting. But I think so uh, what will motivate individual is just interest. Like the, yeah. there, was, there was an important interest in doing it uh, yeah. at this moment. And yeah. I, I don't know if it's still a thing, but maybe it lost some interest over time and so maybe there are less yeah. and less reviewers of uh, this uh, preprint tracker. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I guess um, maybe the main thing to do to emphasize um, uh, peer reviews from uh, anybody would be to try to frame it as uh, you really have a personal interest uh, in it. It made mm -hmm. me think of Publons. Uh, mm -hmm. Publons, uh, yeah, yeah, a way to publicize uh, all your, your peer reviews, but maybe also paid peer reviews, which is more yeah. complicated to do, but... Uh, yeah. 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 I think, you know, I think payment would be good, even just a token payment that, you know, it shows that there's value to what you're asking people to do, I think could be helpful. Um, but yeah, I agree. Interest is a really big motivating factor. So if people felt like the more interesting papers, both the high quality, but also maybe low quality, but high influence papers, um, that they could play a role in helping the high quality ones get more attention and the low quality but flashy and you know attractive ones like they could help signal hey maybe you don't trust us so much i think that would help a lot and what i find amazing that we keep donating our time to journals where it's totally a black box about how our review is going to be translated into a, a decision and sometimes it just gets ignored and the editor does the opposite and doesn't give any justification and so on. Whereas here, like your quantitative ratings are going to go into the aggregate. There's no, no one else is going to like, you know, hide them or amplify them or whatever. Everybody's ratings, if they are a member of that community, get weighed the same. Maybe in some, if this really took off, there would be some way to weight different reviews by different people, more or less, depending on their track history as a reviewer. If they've consistently provided reviews that people find valuable, then they get weighed more or something like that. But initially, I mean, at least, yeah, I think there's a lot more chance that your review is going to matter in this kind of system than in the opaque traditional system. So maybe while we still have some time and uh, if no one uh, wants to speak. Maybe you could uh, talk about your ongoing project. Uh, uh. Sure. Yeah. Let me go back to sharing.
That is, if, uh, if no one uh, wants to, because I think a lot of people are shy to ask questions in this kind of situation. Yeah, uh, no, and feel free to jump in and ask. Yeah, totally. Actually, I have one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, yeah, I was thinking about incentives for, for the researchers. Like right now, it's really to get into the top journals because this is what what um, is used as basis for like hiring promotions, awards and, and everything. And um, do you think that in the transition to a world where incentives are really like doing quality research, should, should it be that these quality factors are used to inform publication and acceptance in high uh, ranked journals or how can we make the, the transition to this uh, situation where the incentives are really quality oriented? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think in a system where the papers are all published, say on a preprint server, and then you get these quality evaluations layered on top of that. And then there would still be room for curation, which could be what journals do. What we now call journals could just become curators. It's a group of people with certain values and they're going to pick out, say like, maybe I'm just going to like, look at all the big five papers published last month and tell you what I think are the most like creative of the, the new, it's almost an oxymoron to say like creative new big five papers. <laughs> but um, And so my table of contents every month is gonna be, and maybe I'm with a group of people who have those shared interests and values. And we're gonna say every month, like here are the top five papers. If you're looking for creative new personality structure papers, this is our list. Um, and we rely on the evaluations that are already made on the papers, the quantitative ratings, the quality factors, but there's still this extra kind of added layer of like this group of people with these particular values highlighted my paper in their table of contents. And so you could put that on your CV and it doesn't, and it's not exclusive, right? If, if one group highlights it, it doesn't mean another group can't also pick it for their table of contents, but I could imagine those kinds of things being counted a lot too. So maybe a hiring committee would be like, oh, wow, they wrote papers that got pu published whatever linked to in like 10 different tables of contents by groups that value very different things. Like the, the people who value creativity, like their work, but the people who value rigor also highlighted their work. I think that would be a cool, I mean, that's kind of what, what we think journals do now, but they do it very implicitly and we're not even sure that they really do it right. But we think of different journals as valuing different things, but it's kind of a guess. And yeah, it's, so it would be kind of just making more explicit why we have different journals because they supposedly they value different things and so let's see that more transparently thank you for your presentation i have a question too um in the last part of your presentation uh it should be about prevent abuse uh, yeah and what is the main um, abuse, what, what kind of uh, abuse should be the yeah. and, and how to prevent it? Yeah, okay, so I think one is the possibility of um, corruption, so people like reviewing, secretly reviewing their own work or, or their friend's work or kind of peer review rings, the possibility of um, people uh, being bullies or acting unprofessional, you know, violating professional norms. Um, or an, any kind of unfairness, right? Like bias against certain groups or things like that. Um, and I think that the main solutions are to have a system like the pre-review.org in, in biology, where there is there are moderators of the platform and they know who everyone is. And so they could catch if there are like reviewer rings. There's also a code of conduct. And so that when you make, make an account, it's linked to your ORCID. So you're verified as like, you really are you. And you can choose to use a pseudonym on the website, so you don't have to identify yourself as a reviewer, but the people who run the website know who you are. And so if you violate the code of conduct, you act unprofessionally, they can kick you off or at least delete your review or something like that. So I think there are solutions to these problems. And also these problems exist in the old system and the solutions there aren't great either. There's all kinds of bias and unfairness in the peer review system and we don't see it. Well, thanks. It, it's Ferdy, so I, I'm, I'm seeing the, the time. So uh, um, it, it, I don't know if anyone would have a, a last question, but if, if nobody has any question, I think we we, we might let you go, Freddy, because it, it's going, it's going, it's getting late, I guess, uh, in mm -hmm. Australia. 
But uh, thanks again for the presentation, and uh, I think uh, I'll keep really updated uh, on your project because uh, it's really a, it could be a fascinating uh, new movement to peer reviewing. And uh, thanks. yeah, well, yeah. thanks. And if anybody has any other thoughts or questions, feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you or keep the conversation going. And thanks again for inviting me. Great. Right. Thank well, you. thanks for being here. <laughs> it was really great, and uh, yeah, it was really uh, an honor, as I said, and. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody.